Heavenly Father, we give you praise, we give you thanks, we give you glory, we give you honor. You are worthy of this and so, so much more. I ask you, Father, to um, speak to everyone's heart here that is listening, uh, whether they be live or sometime in the future as it's being recorded. I pray, Father, that your word would go forth, would accomplish that which you have sent it from on high. Father, I pray that my voice would be simply an echo of what you have already declared and decreed from on high in heaven, on, upon your throne. I pray, Father, that it would ripple in the earth like, like water does when a pebble is thrown into a pond or a lake, and that these ripples would have the effect that you have um, desired uh, for your word to do and to accomplish. So, Father, open up the eyes of our heart, open up the ears of our heart, for they do have eyes and they do have ears, our hearts, our spirits, so that we may see and we may hear and we may understand the things that you are speaking to us all. I ask you in Jesus' name. So, brethren, we are going to discuss and talk about some things that are found uh, in the parable of the sower. Um, hopefully you all see on your screen uh, the scriptures that are displayed. Um, parable of the sower is talked about in Matthew and Mark and in Luke. For whatever reason, it was never brought about in John. Um, but when we look at the parable of the sower, there's many different aspects that can be focused on. Some might focus on the sower. Well, who's the sower? What's his deal? What's his purpose? Some might focus on the seed. And then others may focus on well, where the seed fell. And I think all of those have importance. It just depends on what God is trying to speak to you about which is why I prayed today that God would be the one speaking, because sometimes God will speak one particular message, and depending upon the person that's listening, they get a different message. And I think the parable of the sower explains why. Some people in a group of, say, a hundred can hear one man, one woman speak, and all come away with a different understanding, with a different message. And so when we look at the parable of the sower, it's an important parable for, for, for many reasons. Um, and one that we're going to, to get into uh, fairly soon. But let's just introduce the parable of the sower because there may be some that are listening that have never even heard or read of the parable of the sower. Um, but again, it was spoken of in three different gospels in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And it's a very simple teaching. Parable is just another word for a teaching, a, a way of trying to help others understand uh, something they may not by using uh, another type of teaching, a metaphor, something that's figurative. Um, and so Jesus is teaching the multitude. He's teaching his disciples that are there, and he's trying to convey to them something that is beyond them right now. And he's trying to use something natural, something that they understand because they live it. And everyone in that day, in that age, understood what it was to be a farmer, a sower, a one who sows seed in places and on wanting to have a crop and wanting to, to bear the fruit of that crop, to feed themselves, to feed their family. And so he, he starts off by basically saying, you know, there was a sower that went out to sow. And when he went out to sow, he was sowing obviously seed and some of the seed fell by uh, a wayside type of uh, ground. Um, it wasn't the ground that you'd want to, to sow seed. It may have just fell out of the sack or, or just, uh, um, you know, just fallen on, on the way that while he was walking to the place that he wanted to sow the seed, but it, it kind of just fell by the wayside. And because it wasn't particularly the ground that was suitable for seed, uh, the birds came and they said, oh, well, he dropped seed. Well, that's an easy pickings for me. And they just came and they just devoured it up. And if you look at the, the, the three verses in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all pretty much say 
the same regarding this seed that fell by the wayside and the birds that came. But there's one in particular uh, verse that I underline here, and it's in Luke, and it says, not only did it fall by the wayside, not only did the birds of the air devour, but it was trampled upon. Now, obviously, I said that this particular wayside was not the particular place you wanted to sow the seed. This is the wayside was where everybody traveled on. They came with their horses or their donkeys or their, you know, their stagecoach, if you will, or their cars or, or, or just they just walked on by and they didn't really care much about the seed. It didn't have any significance to them. And they said they just stepped on it. They just trampled on it. And that makes sense. It was in the wayside, obviously. But then as the sower went out to sow, there was some seed that fell on stony places. And the, these are the places that didn't have much earth, much soil. Um, and, and they couldn't get deep down into the ground, obviously, because it was stony ground. And if you look at the two verses in Matthew and Mark, they're pretty much saying the same thing regarding uh, there's no earth. Uh, they didn't have much earth. And then when the sun uh, obviously came up, uh, as it does each and every day, it scorched it and there was no root. It withered away. But Luke doesn't say stony places. It says some fell on rock. It just simply says it fell upon the rock and, and it withered away, obviously, because that sun came up like Matthew and Mark, uh, Mark said, and it says it lacked moisture. Well, that, that's referring to the, to the rockiness, that stoniness, that hardness. You know, and I, I don't know if any of you have uh, ever trekked up Stone Mountain, um, but it, it's kind of funny to me, uh, you know, when you look at it from a plane, it literally looks like a zit on the earth. Um, but when you're actually on this Stone Mountain and you're, you're traversing up the stone, it is literally a stone. It's just a big mold of rock. And yet there are some places where there's just a little bit of soil is there's some trees that are growing. They're not big, they're not huge. They're not like, you know, huge trunk of trees, but they're, they're small trees that are growing on this rock. But it, it's not a, an amazing amount of trees that are on this rock. And obviously because it's on a rock, there's only so much soil it can gain its, nur its nur nutrients and nourishment from. And it's only so deep that it can go because there's that rock that's in the way. So when I hear this parable of the sower and I, and I try to relate it to things that I understand that I've experienced, well, my experience is walking up Stone Mountain and seeing very few trees. And, and if I do see trees, they're not very large, they're not very luscious. And it's kind of amazing that they're even growing there. So I come down to the next bit, which the sower continued walking around and some seed fell among thorns. And the thorns sprang up and they choked them. And it says in, in, in uh, Mark that not only did it where the, the thorns didn't grow up and it, it, and it was choked, it yielded no crop. That was something that wasn't said in Matthew. That was something that wasn't said in Luke, but it specifically says it yielded no crop. And so that's important because when a sower goes out to sow seed, he sows it with the expectation that he's going to get a return of some kind. If he's sowing apple seeds, he's going to expect an apple tree or, or fruits of apples. If he sows uh, seeds of strawberries, he's going to expect strawberries would come forth so that he can eat and his family can eat of those fruit of that crop. But in this place, it fell among thorns and it was choked and it yielded no crop. And I would say the same thing happened to the stony ground. It didn't say it didn't yield no crop, but considering how there was no root, considering it says it withered away, uh, I would find it very difficult for it to be able to grow and yield the fruit that it desired. And then we come to the last place. There is a particular place that the seed fell and it was on good ground. And most all the, the accounts, the parallel passages is what I call them, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all talking about the same speaker giving the same message, 
And because of the different um, listeners, maybe, or the recorders of the gospel, you may get different details throughout. But in this particular detail, detail, it's pretty similar. They fell on the good ground. It yielded crop, some 100, some 60, some 30. Another version has it, you know, in reverse, some 30, some 60, some 100. But the point of the matter is that it yielded crop. And that's what you want. You may want a lot of crop, but if you only get 60% of the crop, you're going to be happy that you got something out of it. The last thing you want is to have nothing out of it. 30 is better than nothing. 60 and 100 is better than nothing. And then he ends with, Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so thus ends the parable. Jesus is speaking to the multitude. He's speaking to his disciples. And, and he kind of just ends it right there. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so you could be one of those multitudes out there. You're listening to Jesus speak. He's the very word of God. And depending upon where that seed falls, you're going to get something produced, get something out of it. But he just stops there. If you're that multitude there and you're just listening, he just stops and says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And he just ends it. I would think you would be, why did he talk to us about that? What was the point of that? And so some obviously followed him for a certain while, listening to him and kind of went away talking amongst themselves to their brother, to their sister, to their uncle, to their aunt, and maybe saying, what was that all about? But you know what? They talked amongst themselves about it, and then they went about their daily lives. If they were really, really interested in what he meant, what he said, what would you have done? If you were really, really interested in what he meant and what he said, would you talk about amongst people that also listen to the same message? Or would you try to talk to him? Today, we live in a day and age where we have internet, we have email, we have phone, we have cell phone, we have so many ways to try to contact and have a discussion with someone. And if we're really, really interested in having that discussion, we will find a way to do that. We will get on Google Duo, we will get on Zoom, we will get on Google Meet, we will get on GoToMeeting, we will get on the phone, we will get on our cell phone, we will send an email, we will send a text, we will do all of these things because we want to understand. And if we don't want to understand, we're not going to try. Well, there was some disciples there. They followed Jesus wherever he went. It didn't matter whether it was in the morning, the noon, or the nighttime. They literally hung out with him all day long. They were the disciples. And the disciples came to him. They didn't understand what he was talking about. You can read that in Matthew chapter 10 and Mark and in Luke. They all talk about the same thing. They didn't understand. Yet they were the only ones that came back to Jesus. And they asked him, why do you speak to them in parables? As if they did understand, but they didn't. And he starts explaining to him, it has been given to you. Who? You. Who again? Wait, wait. Who? You. It has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Who was he speaking to? His disciples. What was the trademark of the disciples? They followed him wherever he went. They listened upon his every word wherever he went. They followed in his footsteps wherever he went. Those are disciples. Those are ones that are interested in understanding. They are interested in knowing for themselves, what is he really talking about? And then he says, 
to them, whoever has to him more will be given and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, whatever he has will be taken away from him. This is why I speak to them in parables, he says, because in seeing they do not see, in hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And so what I am doing is I am fulfilling the scripture from the prophecy of Isaiah, who said, you will hear and you will not understand. You will see and you will not perceive for the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. I think that's important that we understand that hearing is more than hearing with ears. Seeing is more than seeing with our eyes. Because Jesus takes it from the natural, which is the ears and the eyes. And he says, the hearts of this people have grown dull and their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes have closed, which is to say that the heart of man has ears. The heart of man has eyes to see. That inner man, that spirit of man, has ears and eyes. And it is how we internally understand what's going on around us. We can't solely rely upon the natural and what we hear. It is Babel out there if you haven't noticed. Babel. Confusion. It is short for Babylon. You pick up the news stories, confusion everywhere. Pick any news station. I don't care whether you're liberal or conservative. It is Babel. It is confusion. By the time you finish listening, you don't know what to believe. Are we just trying to listen to the people that are going to scratch our tickling or itching ears? Is that why we listen to the news? The challenge is for us to listen with the ears of our heart and to see with the eyes of our spirit. Jesus ended in Matthew, speaking to the disciples, blessed are your eyes for you see, your ears because you hear. I say to you that there were many prophets, many righteous men who desired to see what you see and did not see it. They desired to hear what you're hearing and they did not hear it. So the disciples were expressing a trademark that Jesus was looking for. They were seeing, they were hearing. How did he know? Because they were coming to him and asking him, what are you really talking about? It says in Mark that the 12 around him asked him about the parable. Not just why do you speak to them in parables? They were asking him, what does that parable mean? If you read Luke, it says more in detail. What does this parable mean? And this parable is so important because if you look at all Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when he started speaking in parables on a regular basis, this was the foundation parable. He said in, 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 in Mark's account, 
do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? I don't know what that speaks to you, but I know what it speaks to me. It speaks to me that I can't understand any of his parables and his teachings unless I understand this one. Do you not understand this parable? The one that I just spoke about. The one that you're asking me about. This one that man has titled the parable of the sower. It wasn't titled that. We've kind of come up with that parable. It could have been the parable of the seed. It could have been a parable of the different grounds. I, I don't, it's what we titled it. But he's saying, if you don't understand this parable, how are you going to understand all the other parables? What other parables is he talking about? Well, there's a parable of the tares and the weeds. You may want to look that up, but you may want to understand what this parable is talking about first. There's a parable of the fig tree. There's a parable of a seed that grows. There's a parable of the mustard seed and leaven. There's a parable of defiling. There's a parable of the tenants or the wicked tenants. There's a parable of the hidden treasure. There's a parable of the pearl of great value. There's a parable of the net. There's a parable of new and old treasures. There's a parable of the wedding feast. And there's a parable of the lamp being covered. All of these parables I just mentioned will not be understood appropriately or correctly if we don't understand the parable of the sower. So let's look in detail at what Jesus says because he doesn't leave them out in a limb. He explains the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower is talking about anyone who hears the word of the kingdom. Do you see that in Matthew? Anyone who hears the word of the kingdom. That's what this parable is about. And when it talks about the seed that fell by the wayside, it's talking about a person that hears the word, but doesn't understand it at all. Notice what it says, the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown, where? In his heart. If you stay in the natural, you're not going to get anywhere. The things of the spirit are spiritually discerned. The carnal man cannot understand the things of the spirit because they are spiritually discerned. The carnal man sees the things of the spirit as foolishness. This wayside ground represents a type of a heart of a man. There are different types and kinds of men, if you will. There's different types and kinds. And I say that generically. I'm not talking about male and female. This refers to both male and female. If you haven't noticed, man was made male and female. So I'm talking to all, well, only two genders. I might get canceled for that, but I'll live. Male and females both have a heart and it was given to them. It was created. It was literally breathed into them by God. And when a man or woman hears the word of God and doesn't understand it, the enemy comes in. Satan comes in in a variety of ways, a myriad of ways to distract, to confuse, to make that person not think much of the word. They may start thinking about the next movie, the next song, the next place they need to go to work, 
the next place they need to go get groceries, what's on the list, anything at all all that has to do in that man's life, Satan will use to snatch away the seed, which is the word of the kingdom. In other words, it is the word of God. Because if that person were to believe in the word of the kingdom, they might get saved. You see that in Luke chapter 8. He takes the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But again, the wayside ground is not a particular ground you would think that the sower would come to sow. So that leads us to the next ground, the stony ground. Or the ground or the seed that landed on a rock. Now, interestingly enough, the ground that was really a stony place or a rock received the word that it heard. And it received it with joy. He received it with joy. He heard it and received it with joy. She heard the word and she received it with joy, with gladness, it says. But there's a problem in that man or that woman's heart. The seed doesn't get root. There isn't a foundation for that seed to grow. Why? Because of the same reason that the trees on Stone Mountain do not grow as big and as proliferous as if they would on, on regular, regular ground where there's no rock underneath. It can't grow deep. If you know anything about trees, the taller they grow, the deeper and the more widespread the root is underneath the earth. So you see, some people have this stony, rocky kind of heart, and they hear the word, and they believe it. They receive it with joy. They're happy about it. They're glad about it because the, the word of the kingdom is a word of hope. It is a word of encouragement. It is a word that brings light. It is a word that brings life. And so it, it, it's no strange thing that this kind of heart would not recognize it. But there's a problem. Like every seed, when it goes into the ground, it has to die and then it has to create its own new root system. It has to grow deep into the earth before it can come out of the earth and then start growing up and out and bringing forth fruit. It needs a deep grounded foundation. But it can't in a man or a woman that is stony or rock. They'll believe for a while. They will endure for a while. But as Matthew and Mark says, when the tribulation comes, when the persecution arises, because of the word, they immediately stumble. Now that's one way or one of two ways that Matthew and Mark describe this man or this woman that gladly received the word. But when persecution, when tribulation arises, when they started getting made fun of, when they started getting isolated, when they started getting rejected, when they started getting put off to the side, when they started getting canceled because, oh, they couldn't say that on Twitter. They couldn't say that on Facebook. They couldn't say that on whatever social media because everybody came out of the woodwork like roaches in the dark, started attacking them for what they said and what they believed. They began to shrink and crumble under that oppressive pressure. But I think it's interesting how Luke describes it. 
not only did they receive the word with joy, they had no root, they believed for a while, but in time of temptation, they fell away. Temptation. In this particular context, it is not to do with temptation of sinning, the temptation to go do something wicked or evil. In this context, temptation is really the word for testing. It is really the word for trial or, or proving. When the testing of their faith, the trial, the proving of their faith came, they couldn't stand. Because in themselves was a place of rock and stone. So there's the second type of ground which is representative of the second type of person that walks this earth. They can recognize it. They can hear the word. They can receive it with joy because within themselves, they are rigid. They are firm. They are like a rock, a stony place. That seed is not going to gain the root that it needs. And so they fall away. And so then we come to the seed that fell among the thorns. Now, this type of person, he, he or she also hears the word. In verse uh, 22, in verse 18 of Mark, and in verse uh, 14 of Luke, they all heard the word. But there were thorns in their life. What, what does that mean? The thorns that, that Jesus used as a metaphor, as a teaching tool. Well, that's the cares of the world. Each individual has cares. Some of those cares are the deceitfulness of riches. Some of those cares are the pleasures of this life. Some of those cares are the desires for other things. Other things in contrast to what? the word of the kingdom. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If there are things in this world that you care for more than him, more than for his word, you are going to become unfruitful. Those pleasures of life, those desires for other things, the deceitfulness of riches and the cares are going to choke the word that you heard, that you received. And in Matthew and Mark, it says you will become unfruitful, unfruitful but in Luke, it says you will bring no fruit to maturity. You know, recently, one of my daughters came home and they were eating my blueberries. I mean, it is our blueberries. And they, they I mean, they just, they were just popping them in their mouth, like, like just popping them in, popping them in, popping them in. Then all of a sudden I bought some uh, other blueberries because we were running out. They had eaten all my blueberries. So I bought another thing of blueberries and then they started popping those in too. But they said, "Ugh, this doesn't taste as sweet as the other one. Well, I can tell you that a farmer wants his fruit to grow to maturity because if it doesn't, it's not the same. It might as well just be unfruitful. Who wants to eat a strawberry that doesn't have the sweet, succulent juices of a strawberry? Who wants to eat an orange that isn't that succulent, rich, citrus taste of an orange and sweet, natural? Nobody wants to eat a, a, a strawberry or an orange or an apple or a grape or any of the fruits that we all enjoy if it's not sweet. So yeah, they can receive the word, but over time, over time, 
there'll be a battle. There'll be a battle for the things that they want in this world. And maybe the thing that they initially thought they wanted when they heard the word. And in the end, it'll be a losing battle. Which brings us to our last ground, that good ground. The seed that fell on the good ground is, is that type of person that hears the word and he understands it. I like how Mark says it. He hears the word and he accepts it. But I like Luke. It says he hears the words with a noble, with a good heart, an honest heart. He keeps it. I love that part. He keeps it. It's like when you make a promise and you keep the promise. That's the important part. Not making the promise, but keeping the promise. So it says you hear the word, you understand it. And then what happens is you produce fruit. Some 60, some 30, some 100. I like how Luke says you keep it and you bear fruit with, I love this word, patience. Because in order for you to produce fruit, you got to be patient. Fruit doesn't just pop up overnight for an, uh, an apple tree or an orange tree or the vine of a strawberry or a grape. None of those fruits that we love and enjoy happen overnight. It takes time. The seed is planted. We may water. We may, we may do what we can on the outside, but it is God who brings about the growth. And that growth is in his time. That's talked about when it talks about, you know, the members of the body. They're placed in a specific place by God's design to fulfill his purpose. That's by God's design. And the same thing happens in the natural world as in the spiritual world. The word of the kingdom will grow in the man or woman's heart that receives it, understands it, accepts it, and keeps it. And over time, with patience, the fruit will be brought forth. The promise will be fulfilled. Like I said, there's a lot of aspects that you could focus on. You could focus on the sower if you want. You could focus on the seed if you want. You could focus on the grounds if you want. I think in my particular case for today, I think the emphasis I'm trying to, to thrust upon is the types of ground and the types of people that are in this earth. And I say that as if I'm the one sowing right now, I'm the one teaching, I'm the one sharing, but I'm, I'm involved in that. Don't get me wrong. I'm one of those four types. And I'm not done yet. And all of these that are listening to this word are one of these four types of people. And it is imperative for you to find out. You need to know whether you're that wayside guy or gal. You need to know whether you're that stony gal or stony guy. You need to find out if you're that gal or guy with all those thorns that are in the way. And it's real important for you to know, are you that guy or gal with that good ground, with that noble and good heart? That noble is a beautiful, the word is a beautiful heart. And, and, and you're not, it, it, it's important for us to recognize that in order to be a beautiful, noble, and good heart, it is all contingent upon 
what we do with the word of the kingdom that we hear. Because if we hear it and don't do anything with it because we don't understand it, then we're the wayside. If we hear the word and we receive it with joy, as it says up here, but we're that rocky ground, there's hardness in us. There's places we don't want to change. We don't want to be malleable. We don't want to humble ourselves. Then we're the ones that are deciding our own future. Because in time, because of the testing, the proving, you're going to fall away. If we are constantly battling with desiring the things of this world, it's music, it's movies, it's sports entertainment, the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, we're not going to make it. Our bishop says, you know, we got to have a checkup from the neck up. The word says that when you read the word, it should be as a mirror unto you. It should be a revealer of the thoughts and intentions of your own heart. We need to know what kind of person we truly are, and we need to know it in truth, not in what we wish it to be, not in what we desire it to be. We have to know in truth what type of person we actually are. I think of this word as well. Because some of us who are truly, truly, truly in the kingdom, we bear a responsibility. We bear a, a, an obligation of service. It is a reasonable service unto the Lord that we share this same word of the kingdom that we became so zealous about, joyful about, understanding it. We need to go and spread the seed. I'm sure all of you have noticed that when you've eaten fruit, the fruit has a seed somewhere. So I'm kind of asking, what do you do with that seed? When you eat your watermelon, do you just consume it with the seed? Some of us do. Some of us spit it out. But we spit it out carelessly because you want to get it out the way and just throw it on the ground. And But that's one thing that we could do naturally. It's not a bad thing to just, you know, spit out the seeds. I'm not getting that. But I'm talking about spiritually. When you receive the word of the kingdom, what do you do with that seed? Do you just frivolously spit it out, not caring where it goes? Or maybe you're that type of, of man or woman that, you know, has some yard in, the, in their backyard maybe or, or creates a plot uh, uh, for themselves to grow fruit for yourself in your own home that you may be able to feed yourself and feed others with. And so then you replicate and reproduce that seed There are two examples that I want to bring up to you. One is in Acts chapter 17. It has to do with Paul. Both examples have to do with Paul. And the other has to do with Paul again in Acts chapter 28. Now, the first situation is Paul is, is ministering. He's sowing the seed. He is giving the word of the kingdom. 
and he is around Mars Hill and he's around the Greeks and he's looking at all of the different gods that they're worshiping and he comes across a particular inscription on an altar. It says to the unknown God. And he uses that as a teaching moment. He says, I want to talk to you about this unknown God that you have this altar for. This is the God that I speak of, whom you do not know of. Let me tell you about him. He made the world. He made everything in it. He is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he does not dwell in the temples made with hands. He is not worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, because he gives all life breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. And he has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling so that all should seek the Lord in the hope that they may grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live, we move, we have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. He even rec He's even recognizing to the Greeks that you recognize that there is this God and we are his offspring. And since we are his offspring, you don't know how close you are to the truth when you say that. You ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or something that is shaped by the art of man's devisings. Since we are the offspring of God, why do you think that he is this gold uh, uh, statue that you've made or this silver statue or this stone statue that you carved out yourself? That can't be God. But you know what? These are the times of ignorance that God has overlooked. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he is appointed a day that he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And you know what? I didn't hear him talk about naming specifically Jesus. He took the existence of God and started to extrapolate to the Greeks how, yeah, you are the offspring of God. You don't even know how close you are to that, but it's not by, because you built this or built that and you start worshiping this and that. But this God is going to judge the whole world, so you better repent. And he's going to judge the world by a man whom he has ordained. Now he's referring to Jesus, but he has a name mention of him. You know what? You know what caught their attention? Not the existence of God. What caught their attention is this idea of the resurrection from the dead. And they began to mock him. And others said, wait, um, well, well, um, uh, you know what? We want to listen to you again on this matter. And Paul could have said, you know what? Give me a day. Give me a time. But he didn't. He says in verse 33, D Paul departed among them. What? The great apostle preacher? He just departed? That's it? He didn't stay? Yeah, he didn't stay. But look at what it says next. It says, however, some men joined him and believed. Among them, Dionysius, the Aeropagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And so me, that is, to me, that is a perfect example of the types of people that there are in the world. The ones that went and joined him, specifically, it says they what? Believed. Now, which believed? I don't know. Is it the stony ground believers? Is it the thorny ground believers? Is it the good ground believers? I don't know, but they believed. And neither did Paul but he allowed them to join him. And if you paid attention to his ministry, I am sure you will agree with me that he continued to minister to them the way more perfectly. But it wasn't Paul's responsibility to find out 
what heart he was sowing into. The sower that went out to sow the seed, hey, it fell by the wayside, it fell by the stony places, it fell by the thorny ground, and it fell by the good ground. And that's all Paul was doing. He was just sowing his seed. He was spreading it wide. And if some wanted to believe and join him, so be it. And if others didn't, but they wanted to talk with him later, and the others wanted to mock him, did he stay? Did he argue? Did he fight? He went on about his business and he continued to ministering to who was receiving his word, those that were believing. The same thing happened in Acts 28 with Paul. He had been jailed, he had been in prison, and he was on his way to Rome. And he called the Jews together. He said to the men and brethren, I haven't done anything against our people. I haven't done anything against the customs of our fathers. I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they examined me, they wanted to let me go. But, but, but there was no cause for putting me to death. And then so the Jews spoke out against it. And so I had, to, I had to compel to appeal to Caesar. It's not that I had anything against to accuse my nation to him, but they wanted to kill me for no reason. So I had to appeal to Caesar. And for this reason, I have been called before you to see you and to speak with you because for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. But you know, they responded to him, these Jews, and they said, listen, we didn't receive any letters from Judea concerning you. We don't have any brethren who have come to us for report or spoken any evil of you. But you know what? We want to... We, we, we want to hear what you think concerning this sect that we've been hearing about. You know, we know that it has been spoken against everywhere, this Christian sect. And so they appointed him a day. In other words, they made an appointment and they said, hey, yeah, we're going to get with you and we're going to listen. And many came to his lodging, Paul's lodging, and he explained and he solemnly testified of the kingdom of God. You might as well say the word of God. And he was persuading them concerning who? Jesus? From where? The law of Moses and the prophet. And he was doing from morning to night. And some were persuaded by the things which were spoken. And some disbelieved. There it is. There's different hearts. There's different types. I don't know which one we're, we're speaking to, and neither did Paul. Some believed, and some did not. And then look at what he says. He quotes what Jesus said to the parable of the sower, even though Paul didn't walk with Jesus during the time of his ministry, but he knew the word, and he knew that in Isaiah it said, go to this people and say, hearing you will hear and shall not understand, seeing you will see and not perceive, for the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I I should heal them. He basically quoted the scripture from Isaiah that Jesus quoted as well during the parable of the sower. This is what it's all about. We're going to sow our seed and some are going to hear and some are not. Some are going to see and some are not. But that doesn't dissuade us from sharing the good news of this message. I don't know if you've ever thought about or considered that on the seventh day, God rested. He created for six days and on the seventh day, he rested. Jesus came near on about that fourth day and he died and he rose from the grave and he died for the sins of the whole world. Not for the sins of his own people, but the sins of the whole world. Salvation is open to the whole world. There's really nothing else that needs to be done on Jesus' part for man to be saved because when he died and when he shed his blood and when he ascended into heaven, he sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat. And because he sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat, the whole world has 
an opportunity to obtain mercy that they have never had before. So if he died for the sins of the whole world, why are there some people that are going to go to hell? I can guarantee you that it has nothing to do with Jesus failing. Jesus did absolutely everything that needed to be done to redeem mankind. You know who it's incumbent upon to receive their own salvation? It's man. And how they respond to his word. Paul continues saying, let it be known unto you that the salvation of God has been sent unto the Gentiles. They will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and uh-oh, uh-oh, a great dispute among themselves, fighting back and forth, back and forth. What is he talking about? What is he saying? Blah, 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 blah. Then Paul dwelt a whole two years in his own rented house and received all who came to him. So obviously there were some that instead of going to the person who's giving out this word to explain himself, wanted to argue amongst themselves, but there are some that came to him. And he preached the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence. No one was forbidding him. And those are two perfect examples of the types of people that hear the word of God and what do they do? What do they do with the word that has been received? And it's the same challenge that has been given in the old covenant. This is not a new thing. I only point it out and highlight it to you because some of us may think we're in the kingdom, but we've gone nowhere, literally nowhere in Christ. We are basically the same person we were years ago when we thought we had received Christ or thought we had obeyed or thought we had done what was necessary. but the decision is yours. How far do you want to go with Christ? Do you have a ceiling as it's been described where you're only going to go so high because you just, nah, I'm not going to go that far. Is there something holding you back from going as far as you possibly can with Christ? Because the choice is yours. And it has always been yours. From the Garden of Eden, the choice is yours. I give you the tree of life. Have at it. Have as much as you want of it. Just don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The choice is yours. He repeats that same challenge with Joshua in chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. Joshua said, now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Brothers and sisters, both in the house and outside the house, because I don't know who I'm speaking to today. The choice is yours. Who are you going to serve? In Deuteronomy, it says, I call heaven and earth as a witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. God says, choose life. And in doing so, you and your descendants will live. 
that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And those are our forefathers in the faith, maybe not in the flesh, but who cares? It's the fathering in the faith. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the God that manifested himself in the flesh in order to die for your sins, to pay the penalty for your rebellion so that he can give you a second chance. Because his heart was he wanted to forgive you. No matter how much pain and suffering and tribulation it cost him. He wanted you. You are his desire. He is to be our utmost desire, but you know what? You are his utmost desire. To do all that he did, you must be his utmost desire. Because he didn't do that for the angels. He didn't do that for the animals. He didn't do that for the sea creatures. He didn't do that for the fowl of the air. He did it for you. When we go out and minister and share this word, this good, good word, this encouraging word, this saving word, don't get offended at how people respond. You should appreciate, you should have the understanding that some people are gonna respond believing and with joy, and some people are just not. And some people are gonna mock, and some people are gonna dispute, but don't get offended. Jesus said to his disciples, when you go out and minister, Go into whatever city, go into whatever town, figure out who is worthy of this word that you're going to give them and stay with them. When you go into the house, greet it and speak peace upon it. And if this house is worthy, stay. But if it is not worthy, then let your peace return to you. Don't be baffled, don't be confused, don't be angry. Your peace stays with you because he is your peace. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Just shake it off. And know that it, it, it'll, be, it'll be better for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for them in the day of judgment. But that's not why you have peace. You have peace because Jesus is your peace. Now, Jesus told his disciples when they went out to minister in Matthew chapter 10, and I want you to see how they continued steadfastly in that teaching because in Acts chapter 13, when they were going about from Judea to Samaria, to, 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 uh, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth, they ministered in this way. When the Jews were stood up with devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, they raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and they expelled them from the region. But you know what? Paul and Barnabas, they didn't get offended. They just shook off the dust from their feet against them and they came to Iconium and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. That's how we need to minister. Because if he came to show us the footsteps that we need to walk in, and in the same way that he declared this prophecy of Isaiah 61 before he started his ministry, it also applies to us. He said of himself, quoting Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the trees of righteousness. 
you may not have noticed or understood yet, but to eat of the tree of life is to eat of Jesus. He is the tree of life and we have made, and since we are made in his image and he is the tree of life, he calls us the trees of righteousness. And look at what it says of the tree of life in Revelation 22, 20. This tree of life bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month and the leaves of the tree for, for the healing of the nations. Brothers and sisters, we have been created in the image of God, both male and female. And if we are created in the image of God and he is this tree of life that is bearing forth the fruit, each fruit in its own month, and the leaves of this tree are for the healing of the nation, and we are called trees of nitrousness, then we should be doing the same. Our fruit should be the fruit for the world. Our leaves, if you will, should be for the healing of the nation. So I say, if you are led of the Spirit, as it says in Galatians 5.18, you are not under the law. If you are led of the Spirit, you should be bearing forth the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things, there is no law. That's our fruit, brothers and sisters. Don't hoard your fruit in a barn. Don't hoard the fruit for yourself, but let everyone eat of this fruit freely. Let them experience a taste of the love that you have, of the joy that you have, of the peace that you walk in, of the patience that you keep exhibiting to those that are, that are, that are, Oh, they just get on your very last nerve. But be patient with them anyway and let others see that. Let others see the kindness that you keep pouring out on others that are just not treating you the way that you should be treated. They're not treating you with goodness. Let them see your faithfulness while you're going through trials and tribulations that we're supposed to have in the earth. Let them see you faithful. And your gentleness for others and your self-control. Let them eat of the fruit of the spirit in your life and let them decide for themselves what are they going to do with the seed. Don't get me wrong. You are supposed to speak. You are supposed to share the message, but the fruit of your life is not merely in words. It's in your actions. Not only can your words be anointed, but your actions can be anointed of God. And they can taste the fruit by your actions. And they need to taste the fruit by your words. Because it is the hearing of the word of the kingdom that needs to be understood so that they can then hopefully receive it in a noble and good heart. And in time, as they keep the word, as they accept it, as they understand it, they will bear forth fruit themselves. And so each one bears after its own kind. If our kind is the kind of righteousness, then we will bear forth the fruit of righteousness. If our kind is the kind of wickedness, then we will bear forth the fruit of wickedness. If our kind is the kind of stubbornness and obstinacy, then we will produce stubborn and obstinacy. But let us be those that bear forth the fruit of the Spirit. And not take to heart and not take responsibility for those that hear the word and don't do rightly by it. It's up to them. And I love that the choice is up to us. I love that I am not a robot. I love that he took a chance and gave me the responsibility to choose for myself whom I will serve. 
That's the kind of life I want, a life of freedom to serve him righteously. And I think every man wants the freedom to choose for themselves. <laughs> Paradox, whether to be a slave of unrighteousness or a slave of righteousness, but the choice is ours. Parable of the sower has a great, great significance if we will understand it and apply it correctly. As I close out, I want to leave you with one word of consideration. It's written by a very dear brother of mine. I, I love dearly. I haven't seen him in many years, but I miss him. I got to meet him over the internet. Uh, long ago, probably 20 years ago. And he wrote something that I thought was very applicable recently to what I was sharing today. And I'm going to leave this with you. And I just want you to listen and then kind of maybe it will be our prayer as we close out. As soon as I'm done, I will let Elder Luther um, finish up. But just listen to his words, his thoughts and his meditations. And I hope that and pray that they will become your prayer uh, for this upcoming year. He wrote, at the close of this Christmas day, I am sitting alone in the darkness, in quiet contemplation, watching the dancing fire consume away yet three more logs. The warmth of the fire in my fireplace calls to the warmth of the love of God in my heart. I quietly pray that my soul could be as much aflame with the love of God as the big back log, even if it meant that I too must be consumed away to the ashes. The haunting flickering shadows from the light of the fire seems to be speaking to me as I search my soul at the close of this year, anticipating the next. I question my soul. I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus this past year? How many burdens have I lifted? How many chains of oppression and bondage on others have I broken? I cannot help to have a bit of remorse of mind as I think perhaps I could have done a little better. Could I have gone yet one more mile, reached a little farther, touched one more poor struggling soul with a message of hope? Did I miss one bruised, injured, or fallen brother that I could have helped to his feet to give him courage to run on? Is there a sister who needed to hear from a man of God that I failed to impart hope and cheer that would have set her on a right course? Yes. I truly wonder, have I done my best for Jesus since he has done his best, his very best for me? The fire is speaking to me from a hot hearth in the living room, a message clear and emphatic. The fire kindled in my soul so many years ago needs as much fuel today as ever, if not more. I will now get up out of my comfortable chair in which I fall asleep so easily, get some more logs off the porch and stoke the fire. Yes the message is clear. This is no time for the fire to grow weak or the light of it to lessen. I cannot but cry from out of the depths of my soul. Oh God, let me burn. Let all feel the warmth of my love. Let all see the light of my fire in this cold, dark world. Stoke me, oh God. Stir me to do a little better in this coming year cause the love of God to be an invitation to others by which they can warm themselves and see light. As I silently whisper my prayer with tears coursing down my old wrinkled cheeks, I hear myself praying that God would give me the strength to do a little better this year. Pray a little more. Give a little more. Fast a little more. Search the scriptures a little more. Love a little more, reach a little farther and go a little more to someone waiting for a man of God with the right message that will dispel hopelessness and discouragement, releasing in them a new beginning and new life. I lift yet another Kleenex tissue from the box on the end table beside my chair in an effort to dry these old eyes, which have seen much in many parts of the world for so many, many years, yes. We are the sum of our experiences, but how wonderful it would be 
if we could experience fire in our souls, like what this hot glowing fireplace is experiencing, and we too could be consumed away in God when the light of our fire has gone out. And at last, he calls us home, leaving the ashes of ourselves behind.